So um, we're going to turn to our, our reading now, and um, uh, uh, Sue, I think, is going to come and read to us uh, from Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to read the Beatitudes and a little bit more, so the first 16 verses of Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Thank you, Sue. Salt and light. Jesus um, opens this uh, the sermon with the, the these blessed these beatitudes, and then uh, comes in with this uh, this kind of illustration. And uh, like a good preacher, got a good illustration there to draw people in. When we began this uh, a couple of weeks ago, the series I mentioned to you a verse from Colossians chapter one, where. Paul the Apostle says, for, for he, Jesus, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us, transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Paul pictures these two kingdoms positioned against each other. We're born into kind of a, a domain of darkness, separated from God. God gets involved, rescues us from death, brought us, transferred us into his kingdom, new kingdom described as the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of the sun, the kingdom of God by various writers. We are brought or transferred, and that original word that Paul used, uh, methistemi or methistemi, originally means deportation of a group, the removal of a group to form a colony, the taking of a group of people from one place to start something new. And the sense of what Paul is saying is of being transferred into this new kingdom of God's Son. Um, but here's the thing, here's the thing, when you've got two kingdoms that live by very different values, that are set up in a very different thing, these two radically different ways of living, where they touch, where they meet, inevitably, there is friction, isn't there? There is friction. And we can see that going on um, over in Europe uh, at the moment. There's friction. And it's interesting at the end of these Beatitudes that Jesus doesn't ignore that reality of friction. He's very open and he's very direct about it. And uh, the, two, the, the Beatitude I didn't really talk about last time was this, uh, this persecution thing. Blessed are those who are persecuted 
because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Because in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Persecution is the only beatitude that Jesus repeats, actually. don't know if you noticed that. He says it twice. And that he amplifies and expands and qualifies. To see insults, false accusations, and the, the experience of the prophets before us who were ridiculed, humiliated, and imprisoned. To see all that as a blessing is probably the most challenging of the Beatitudes. We are kind of numbered with the prophets in that sense because we stand for something because of who we are when we are Jesus' people. A writer out there called uh, Walter Brueggemann, he uh, writes about the prophets and he says this. He says, the task of the prophetic ministry is to nurture, nourish, and evoke a consciousness, an awareness, and a perception, an understanding among people which is alternative to the consciousness and the perception of the dominant culture around us. Friction. Friction when two sets of differing values have to rub along. Thy kingdom come on earth. That's what the prophets were pointing to in the Old Testament. Thy kingdom come on earth. And it's what we now pray for and live for. Do we? Is that what we want? Yeah, that's what we want. But this inverting of the world's values, this turning the world's values the other way up, this turning things upside down, this disrupting of a status quo out there inevitably causes this bit of friction and even outright persecution, like the challenges that Christians face in countries like Pakistan, China, Syria, Iraq, North Korea. I don't know if you heard on the radio, there was a young man from North Korea telling his story as part of a service this morning on the radio. Another writer out there called Gerard Kelly, he says this, he says, when you turn a pile over and put it the other way up, which is what the Beatitudes do, God's kingdom values are the other way up. When you turn a pile over, those who were at the top, suddenly find themselves at the bottom. The winners by one kingdom's measures find themselves threatened by Jesus' priorities of things like conscience and justice and serving and love and grace. They do not welcome the reversal, the loss of power as they understood it. Loss of position, loss of money loss of all things that they marked as important when Jesus' values come in. Kingdom. It's a fascinating subject, challenging. So salt and light that follows hot on the heels of this talk about uh, persecution. Salt and light. In this context, against the backdrop of these comments on persecution, Jesus launches in and he says to this crowd around him on the hillside, on the mountainside, he says to them and he says to us, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled Underfoot, you are the lights of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone. In the same way, let your 
light shine before your others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. This is about God. You are salt and light. There's, there's, there's such richness in this imagery that we could be here for hours. Why salt and light? And I think it's probably at the, the, the root of this. It's probably because salt and light are what they are. Salt and light are what they are. Salt is salt because it's salty. That is what salt is. That is what salt does. It is salt. Have you ever thought that if we didn't have the miracle of refrigeration, we would be salting everything even now to store our food? It's only refrigeration that has taken away the total reliance on salt for preserving food. Light is light because that's what it is and that's what it does. Simply by being present, it is no longer a dark place. The smallest light changes things entirely. The tiniest sprinkle of salt on a meal and we know it's there. It is what it is. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are who you are. You are what you are. Be what you are for God. There is something here about the essence and the purpose of humanity as God intends us to be his people, his image bearers, his stewards, his kingdom representatives. Salt is well known for its healing, um, for its preserving, for its antiseptic properties, all these things that it can do. It's a guard against food poisoning and all that other stuff that we, we shared earlier on. By being present, salt does what salt does. It just is. Simply by being true to what it is and being there, it applies its qualities to its environment. It affects its environment. Where it is, it is salty. It affects the environment around it. The smallest light, even in the, the darkest of places, has got significance simply by being itself. Light makes a difference. And so it is, so it should be, for God's people. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Kingdom people, being who they are, where they are, bringing kingdom culture, kingdom values, kingdom way of doing life, all those beatitudes, all those blessings, to all aspects of life, community, neighborhood, workplace, college, university, whatever. Being who they're called to be, true to their identity, true to kingdom. If you think about salt, if you go right back to the beginning of the Bible, to Genesis, when God created the world and it was good. It was good. And God made his image bearers. God made men and women who were tasked with what? Preserving the good. Preserving the good. Looking after it. Stewarding it. Being for God where they were in what they were doing. Be what you are. To all those folks on the mountainside listening to Jesus who, who came from this Hebrew Jewish background, salt to them had all sorts of other meanings as well. Salt reminded them of covenant, 
of covenant. They were, after all, a covenant people, God's people. A covenant of salt was a binding agreement. If you look in places in the Old Testament like Numbers 18 and 2 Chronicles 13, you will hear language of covenant where God speaks of an everlasting covenant of salt. An everlasting covenant of salt. Salt was used to seal the deal, became very symbolic of that. And in some cultures today, salt still symbolizes fidelity and friendship. When salt is exchanged, when somebody comes into a house and sits down for a meal, when salt is exchanged, immediately both parties know that trust is there. You don't renege on the exchange, the covenant, when salt has been shared. And to these people, salt reminds them of their calling, their covenant role. Be who you are. Be what you are. Kingdom. Stewards. Image bearers. Serving the purposes of God. That's why I made you. And in Jesus' day, much of what passed as salt what they put into their packets or their bowls or whatever and passed as salt, much of it was actually white powder. They collected most of their salt in that part of the world from the Dead Sea and they scraped it off and dried it out and put it into their containers. But the trouble was most of what they collected that they called salt actually was um, impurities, white powder. Um, And the true salt that was within that white powder, it was very, very susceptible to damp and to water. And if you didn't keep that packet, that bag, that um, barrel of salt, if you didn't keep it very, very dry, very soon the water in the air, the atmosphere would suck the salt out because it's very susceptible to that, leaving just a packet, a barrel, a box of worthless white powder that looked like salt, looked like salt, but it didn't act like salt, and it didn't taste like salt. It didn't do what salt does. What happens if salt loses its saltiness? It's an image that they could relate to. They knew about this. What happens if salt loses its saltiness, loses its its distinctive quality loses what makes it what it is. It looks like one thing, but it's actually another. And Jesus is touching on a subject there that he'll come back to time and again during the Sermon on the, uh, the, Sermon on the Mount, looking like one thing and behaving like another. What happens if salt loses its saltiness. And if we think of light, in our, in our modern world today, light is something uh, powerful, it's generated by electricity, it's all over, it can be hugely bright. And we rarely experience true darkness because we're in the age of light pollution, aren't we? We've got so much light going on, but it wasn't so in Jesus' day. They understood the fear of a dark night and the comfort of even the smallest lamp. Generally speaking, they associated light with fire. All sorts of illustrations there connecting with uh, God. But most lights came from burning um, a little wick on a small oil lamp. And even that light was small by our standards. But if you put many, many, many of those lights together, as in a city, then the collective light, it kind of takes on a strength and a power, a sign of hope that is seen from afar. If you cover up a lamp, it's a contradiction. It's to deny its purpose and its calling. You don't put a bowl over a lamp. You stand the lamp on the lampstand so that it can bless all around. So for us then, 
just to kind of bring this into land for today. What are we to take away from this? Having kind of grabbed our attention right at the beginning of this, this illustration with what seems like exaggeration, making huge statements when Jesus says, you're the light of the world, when we actually know that the big shiny thing in the sky that comes out in daytime, that's the light of the world, surely he makes this big illustration to grab our attention. And having grabbed our attention, with these, these allusions to light, he makes us think about our identity. Our identity. Issues of identity. Who has God made us to be? Who has God called us to be as kingdom people? We feel weak. We feel we can't make a difference. We feel that we don't make a difference sometimes. Sometimes it feels such hard work to rub against this world around us, this friction that's going on all the time. But then Jesus shows us, he, shows, he says to us that actually small makes a difference, little makes a difference. A small pinch of salt, if it's truly salty, makes a difference. A small oil lamp in a dark place makes a difference. Being true to identity is what counts. This is actually not about us. God's upside-down kingdom doesn't work that way. It's about what God is doing in us and through us. In us and through us. As it says elsewhere, it's not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. Be what you are. Be who you are in Christ. In Christ. I'm going to close with a verse from Ephesians chapter 5. Paul writes this in verse 8. He says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Live as children of light. Let's just be still and let's pray for a moment.